Good morning, or actually it's, it's afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, Ministry Academy. I'm so used to saying good morning when I'm up on stage. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to Ministry Academy. This is the segment on uh, church history. I don't know exactly what lesson we're in on church history, uh, but if you, uh, if you would, join with us, uh, and we're going to talk about the beginnings and the middle and, and where we are in the church right now. And as a, as a way of, of, uh, of review, I, I begin church history in the Garden of Eden. And uh, we, we talk about how church really began on the first time that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the morning. That was the first church service. And it didn't take very long before there was problem in church. Uh, it's as early as, as Adam and Eve by themselves before they had any kids, uh, they already were trying to take matters into their own hands. And then Cain and Abel had a disagreement about how to worship. Uh, you think that we have a problem now with people wondering how to worship uh, in church, which way we're, we're supposed to do it? Well, that began back in the garden as well, or shortly after the garden, when Abel offered a sacrifice that was from the choices of his, of his, of his flock. And Cain offered a sacrifice from what he had. And God liked Abel's, but didn't like Cain's, and an argument ensued, and murder actually happened. And sometimes it seems like we get close to that in church when we're talking about whether we have contemporary worship or hymns or what kind of hymns we have, or whether we have organ or piano, whatever. Uh, church always gets into an argument. It usually gets into an argument when someone wants to have control. Um, then we looked at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we saw how the, uh, the, the experience of, of being with God changed over that time until we finally got to Moses when rules and regulations really started getting put in place. And that's when the laws were written down. It wasn't just simply what people knew uh, about God. It was, here is the law that helps you learn the character of God. And, and we see where the laws of the, the land started shaping the, the structure of the church. We started getting not just the priests, but we started getting rabbis. We started getting teachers. We started getting scribes. That's where the scribes and the Pharisees came from. And then we, we look at how the uh, there was the age of the judges when uh, the nation of Israel did whatever it saw fit in its own eyes, and it wasn't always the right thing. Usually it wasn't the right thing, um, and, and they ended up having a lot of trouble because of what they got into, and God sent them in, into slavery, and they, they got beat up by other countries, and so finally they would say, hey, we, we are in trouble, and they cry out to the Lord, and the Lord would send them a judge, and a judge would rescue them over and over and over again, until you get to Samuel. Samuel was the last of the judges, and uh, the Israelites told Samuel, we want a king like all the other nations. They're tired of the judges coming and going. They wanted some continuity. But they said, we want to be like all the other nations. And that was a key moment in church development at that point, in, in national development for Israel. Because they went away from being someone or a nation that was governed by God alone, and now they have a king in place. And God gave them some real warnings about what having a king would be like. And uh, he also said to Samuel, don't be sad that they asked for a king. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. And there's, a, there's an important lesson for us in church history here. Because we want to have things nice and neat and, and hierarchical. We like to have rank. We like to have file. We like to be able to say, this is the clergy. This is the lady. This is your job. That's your job. And the reality is it's becoming more and more like what the world is around us. The essence of church is communion with God. But the realities of it is you have to run the thing. And there's a, there's a balance that is being played. So right around the time when the judges were picked, we realize that the balance is swinging more towards the, the codified church, the rule-driven church. And then we went all the way through the, the kings, through the dispersion, and we get to Jesus' time. And Jesus turned a lot of things on its head. I think the, uh, the quote from The Chosen, the TV show, is, is apt. I think it's good. He keeps telling his disciples, get used different. Because things are changing. Things are going going to move back more towards the relationship and away from the rules and the regulations and, the, and, and one thing on top of another on top of another, which is what had happened to the Jews. They, they took the, uh, the, the law, the, the Torah, everything that was written down by Moses, and they built around the, the law a hedge about the, the law. And what that was is a series of rules and regulations to keep you from breaking the law. But what that did is it got in the way of the relationship a lot of ways between the people of God and God himself. And then we have Jesus who came in. He, he changed the way we look at the Sabbath. He changed the way we looked at cleanliness. He changed the way that we looked at worship. He changed the way that we looked at the laws themselves. He said, you know, you look at it and say, if you kill a person, you're guilty. But I say, 
if you character assassinate a person, if you call a person a raka, or you call a person a fool, you're just as guilty of murder as if you had killed someone, which was a totally new thing that the Jews hadn't really been thinking about. And Jesus was saying, hey, listen, I'm changing all this stuff. I'm making it look new and different. I'm sorry, I keep hitting my screen back here. Um, so we're now up to the point where Jesus has turned everything on its head. He's gone ahead and he's been condemned by the, the, uh, the Jews, by the Romans. He's been crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected. And the, the Feast of Weeks has happened. And the Israelites were sitting up in the upper room, and the, the tongues of fire came down and rested on their heads, and they started speaking in tongues. It was the reversal of the curse of Babel. The curse of Babel created all the nations and separated people, so they were different from each other. And the, the feast or the feast of uh, weeks, the Pentecost came along, and God reversed the curse of Babel. That's what tongues is really all about in a lot of ways, is reversing the isolation that we have between us and God allowing us to speak to him in words we don't understand. But it also gives us the ability to unite each other uh, in language where before we were separated from each other by culture, by ideology, and by language. Now we have the opportunity by the Holy Spirit to not be isolated like that. And then we get to, we get to the point where the disciples are, are really starting to get into following what was being called the way. And that's really the beginning of the Christian church. They aren't yet called Christians. Uh, they are still being talked about as being disciples of the way. And, and Stephen gets, gets in trouble for preaching and teaching. And he gets carried in front of the, the Sanhedrin. And they tell him to explain himself. And he gives one of the best sermons you've ever heard um, given by anybody. And, and they, they, they're incensed. They're furious. Because at the end of the sermon, he says that the, the Jews had always um, attacked and killed their prophets. And they had done the exact same thing with Jesus, who was the very person that could save them. That goes back to something that Jesus had done when he was entering in to Jerusalem on his final week. When he showed up at the gates of Jerusalem and people saw him coming, they started shouting Hosanna. And they started throwing down palm on the ground, throwing their cloaks down. Um, Stephen uh, uh, is kind of talking about that a little bit when he says that he was the one who could bring you peace. And you missed it. Because after Jesus came in and all that stuff was going on, the first thing he did when he saw Jerusalem was he cried. He wept. And he wept because he said, if you only knew what peace was available to you, how you can have peace, you wouldn't have all the troubles you're about to have. The nation of, or the, the city of Jerusalem has been a hotbed of violence and discontent, really from its inception. And, and today is no different. If there is a more contentious place to live on earth, I don't know what town it might be, what city it might be, but Jerusalem. It's always been a hotbed of controversy, and it seems like a lot of history comes to a point right there on top of that hill and jesus is saying if you would have known what was in front of you the rest of your history wouldn't be nearly as as hard as it's going to be so that brings us up to to to, to stephen he tells the, the the sanhedrin he says you have you have heard every prophet that's ever come you've never listened to anything and the one that just came you did the exact same thing to him and they got so mad they took him out to stone him and as they're stoning him stephen sees heaven open and he says i see uh you know, heaven basically looking in and, and he's talking about what he's seeing and it makes him so furious that they they stone him all the harder and as he's dying there's one man standing there watching and his name is Saul Sorry about that. Um, so Stephen is, is standing in front of Sanhedrin. He's explaining his vision. They kill him, and there was a man there watching him. His name was Paul. And it's really important because what's happening now, and something has changed in the way that the Jews are looking at uh, the people of the way, who we will call Christians. Uh, they're looking at it as more and more of a threat to their society. And there was a man sitting there watching. His name was Paul, and he's taking the cloaks, cloaks from the people as they're getting ready to stone Stephen. And he goes on his own vendetta. He's going to go all throughout the countryside killing Jew, killing the Christians. So we have Stephen who gives the sermon. Uh, we have the disciple away with Stephen. But we also show that there's a separation now between what the Jews are, are how they're thinking about Christians and how they were thinking about them before. Because now there's an animosity. So enter um, 
uh, Paul, and kind of a, as a precursor to that, we talk about Peter's vision. Uh, Peter had a moment when he was sitting on top of a roof and he, he went to sleep that a vision appeared to him. And as he's, as he's sleeping, a, a, a blanket was lowered down from heaven. And in the blanket, there were all sorts of unclean animals. And he heard a voice that says, uh, Peter, go ahead, kill and eat. And Peter says, I will not eat what is unclean. And then it happens three or two more times. And, and a lot of people look at that uh, verse and say, what that vision is all about, it's about us being able to eat unclean animals. Well, that's a separate, different kind of discussion, whether we can eat unclean animals or not as Christians. But the vision wasn't about food. The vision was about Gentiles. Because what the Holy Spirit was telling Peter was that there's, there's going to be a bigger movement here. It's not just for the Jews anymore. That the way that the Christian faith that's coming our way is for the whole world, not just for the Jewish people. And what happens because of that, uh, it opens their eyes. And Paul, on his way to Damascus, has a vision. He's actually thrown to the ground, and the Holy Spirit basically takes away his vision, and uh, he's, he's, he's struck blind for a period of time. And uh, a man comes and prays with him who didn't really want to come, and Paul was healed, and he began to be taught by the disciples. And once he got enough teaching in way, he started doing the, the Paul missionary uh, trips. Um, let's see what we have in this. We're just going to hang out there for just a second. The, 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 the distinctives of Paul's missionary trips is this. He would go to a distant land. He would go to the synagogue first, preach to the Jews, and the Jews almost always rejected him. And then once he was rejected there, he would then go and start preaching to the Gentiles. And what he began to see was that the Gentiles were receiving the gospel of Christ, and they were receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they were speaking in tongues. They were doing all the stuff that the disciples were doing, but they weren't Jews. Well, this caused a real problem. It brings us to the next slide. It's the Council of Jerusalem. Because as, as under Stephen, we began to see that the Jews were being more and more persecuted, were persecuting the Christians more and more. What we see also is that as Paul's doing his missionary journey, things that are important to the Jews are not important to the Gentiles. So Paul's missionary journeys are, are really causing a problem because there's all these Gentiles coming in. They don't look Jewish. and They don't talk Jewish. And they don't do Jewish things. So the question is, Is does the Jewish law apply to the Gentiles? Well, there's one group that said absolutely they do. And there's another group that said God is blessing this ministry, and he's blessing it outside of the law. So therefore, the Gentiles don't need to follow it. So they called this big council and in Jerusalem, and the disciples were there, and Paul was there. And the question was, Is what? how much of the law do the Gentiles have to observe? And they came up with a decision. And here's what it, it, it had three things. Well, let's skip down to it. It says, you should not have meat offered to idols, number one. Number two, you shouldn't eat meat with blood in it, and you shouldn't drink blood. Number three, there shouldn't be any fornication. Now, I have up there, the Gentiles saw the decision as you must obey these rules. There's these three things you have to do, which meant there's nothing in there about the festivals. There's nothing in there about the dietary laws. There's nothing in there about... Um, uh, anyway, all the other stuff that the law had, the only thing it was saying you had to do is stay away from meat offered to idols, stay away from blood, and stay away from fornication. Now, the Messianic community said, well, we, we, we're looking at this a different way, because even today, there's, there's the, the strictly Christian community, there's the Messianic Christian community. So if you talk to people, there's a lot of folks, and there's a lot of great people on both sides of this discussion. But there's a lot of people that say we're supposed to be observing the feasts, and we're supposed to be observing the dietary laws, and we're supposed to be observing a lot of these things. The majority of Christendom looks at point number C and says no fornication, and it's referring to sexual stuff. It's not referring necessarily to, um, to anything else other than that. Now, the Messianic community, on the other hand, they don't see it that way. Uh, the understanding of the, kind of the more Jewish sense of it is fornication refers to anything that is outside the law. Now, my personal feeling is that this refers to the sexual sin, not to anything outside the law. Because basically, by saying they, not anything outside the law, you're saying, well, why would you even talk about me offered idols and no blood? Because that's in the law already. Um, by saying that fornication refers to all of the law, takes the, the importance of the Jewish or the Council of Jerusalem away. So there's a difference in the opinion. Uh, the Messianic community says you have to obey all the law if fornication is a departure from the law. 
Uh, the only place that that stayed in effect was in parts of Jerusalem. It didn't stay in place in Rome or a lot of the parts of, of Greece. Um, there's another problem that they were dealing with, and this is a big one that they, they were dealing with early on. So the Judaizers, the ones who said you had to be circumcised, you had to observe, observe the feasts and the food laws and all that, that was one problem that they were dealing with. The other was the Gnostic problem. And Gnostic, it, it literally means knowledge. Um, and there's, there's two parts I want to talk about there. Number one, Gnosticism is a form of paganism. Um, paganism is, is a way of deifying things that are all around you. Uh, and what Gnosticism does is it actually, in a sense, deifies knowledge itself. The second thing is it claims special knowledge. Um, the hallmark of Gnosticism is this. Someone says, I know something you don't know, and by me knowing this thing, I'm at a higher plane spiritually than you are. You can get to my level of spirituality if you understand what I'm, what I know, and I'll teach you to get you there. And you keep on going up the ladder, the more knowledge you get, the higher you get in the spiritual hierarchy in a certain sense. Um, and, and you may think, well, there's not any of that around today. I, I, I really seriously get that there is a lot of Gnosticism around today. Uh, there's Gnosticism in the church. There's, there's something in, in part of the church that's called theosis. Um, there's this idea, and it's primarily in the Eastern Orthodox Church, that you can keep on growing in knowledge of, of God until you become like God himself. And it's like a, a level of deification that you have inside the human being. And only the people that are in, have the theosis, part of the theosis, that have been deified, they're the only ones that can make decisions about what scripture means, what the church does, or what the church says. They're the leaders of the church, and they're the organizers of the church. Uh, theosis is kind of a dangerous idea, in my opinion, because in, in the way I look at it with scripture, if you study scripture, you realize that God doesn't look at your ability and your education or any of that. Paul actually said, all those things that I had that made me special, all that knowledge I had, I count as filthy rights. They're, they're worth nothing. Uh, the only thing that matters as far as how God looks at us is basically if we have accepted him or not. And he is changing us from the inside out. It's not our knowledge. It's not our ability. It's not our study that makes us better. It's that abiding with him and growing greater and greater with him and becoming more and more humble as we go, not becoming better and better, but actually becoming more and more humble. Um, there's, there's Gnosticism in the church today in a lot of other ways, too. I see a lot of that in the church, especially if people start um, basically ranking people based on their spiritual gifts. Uh, some people, and not, not everyone, this is, this is, these are exceptions to the rule. But some people will look at it and say, if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the required knowledge. If you don't know uh, all the different names for the Bible, the Midrash, the Tanakh, the Talmud, and all that, that you aren't as good as the other people are. I, I want to try to my best to dispel that. Because in church, what you're supposed to have is everyone at a, at a level playing field to fill the box. Uh, anything that makes you feel belittled based on what you know is something that is drawing from the, the tradition of Gnosticism and you need to deny it. Uh, so they were dealing with the, the, how do we look at the law? Uh, do we look at all of it or, or just certain parts of it? And they settled on uh, no meat to idols, no blood, and avoid fornication. Uh, and the second thing was the Gnosticism. Are we looking at special knowledge? And is that somehow making us better people? Or are we looking at saying the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is what makes us better people? Um, then we have the theory called the dispersion. Um, so at, at, at a point, there was the majority of the church, or all the church, uh, except for the satellites where Paul made his, his missionary journeys, were all in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the hub. And uh, there, was, there was a lot of history in Jerusalem. If you looked at it, how the Jews dealt with their stuff, all their identity is wrapped up around Jerusalem. And the reason why is that's where their temple is. That's where the, the Holy of Holies are. So if they're going to offer a sacrifice, if they're going to, to bring things in for the the temple taxes, it all has to come to Jerusalem. Everything comes back to Jerusalem. All their festivals, all their feasts tie back to Jerusalem. So it's the hub of their, of their existence. And in Jerusalem, um, there was a big problem because the, the, um, the Christians, the people in the way, were departing from some of the customs and some of the, uh, the, the traditions, and they were accepting Gentiles. This is a big deal. Uh, the people that were still holding fast with the Jewish traditions that didn't see Jesus as the Messiah, saw this as, as traitor. They were, they were abandoning not only the, the Jewish faith, but the Jewish nation and them themselves. If you think that today politically is, is polarized, 
Uh, it's always been polarized with Jerusalem. Uh, and especially when the, the, the people following the way started going their own separate uh, ways. Uh, so the Jews were persecuting the Christians because they weren't doing it the way they used to do it. Uh, and I think we do that today in church too as well. Uh, when we start getting rid of traditions that people have always loved, people get really angry really fast. Um, and if people start introducing new things, there's a lot of distrust given to those new things that come up. Uh, but the, the persecution that they had in Jerusalem was pretty strong because they were throwing people out of the synagogue, which meant that not only did they lose the connection with their religion, their, their, their culture, but they lost their family as well. If your family uh, was still in the synagogue and you were out, you had no access to your family. Uh, there were actually people being stoned and, and people being crucified, and people being uh, killed for the faith by the, the Jewish people. Now, I'm not painting the Jewish people in a bad light because they're Jewish. I'm saying that this happened because people are sinful and, and they're, they're depraved. What happens to us is when we see something we don't like, we lash out in anger. And that's what was happening to the Jews uh, or to the Christians in Jerusalem. And uh, also in Rome, they were, being, uh, they were being hurt by the Romans. Romans. Uh, so the defeat of Jerusalem and the temple destruction. So uh, this was a two-edged sword. The Romans were pagan, and they believed their way of looking at things. And they were highly superstitious. So if anything went wrong, they would blame the Christians for it because they weren't following the rules. And on top of that, the, the Romans didn't like the Jews much because they rebelled. So um, there was a defeat of Jerusalem, the temple of destruction in 70 AD under Nero after the fire of Rome. So the, the Christians had dispersed all over the place, all over the, the Mediterranean area, and they were in Rome. Well, Rome caught on fire. And Nero basically tried his best to blame the Christians for that. To a certain extent, it worked. So the, the, the burning of Rome, and we're going to get a little deeper into that next week, the burning of Rome really set up uh, the temple destruction in Jerusalem. So the fire of Rome, uh, the persecution of Christians in Rome was a big deal. Um, they were driven underground. They were told that they couldn't meet out in public. They were crucified. They were drawn. They were thrown into the, to the arena with the wild animals. Um, life was hard. Um, what was at stake? Okay, both in Rome and in Jerusalem, here's what's at stake. Number one, commerce. There was a lot of stuff that went around uh, with the way things were already set up. So uh, if you're selling animals for sacrifice and the Christians aren't sacrificing, you're losing money. If you're selling idols uh, to help you uh, know what the future is and the Christians aren't buying idols, that hurts your industry. Uh, if you have certain festivals at the temples and the Christians aren't going to the temples, it's hurting your industry. And as more and more Christians were in the society in Rome and they were, they were, there were more of them, they, became, they began to exert more and more pressure on the commerce, on the trade in the, in the town. So commerce was a problem. The second thing that was a problem, both with the Jews and with the Romans, was power. The, uh, the Jewish uh, leaders did not like the way. They didn't like the way because they, people like Stephen said things like he said and made them incredibly angry because he said, y'all are doing it the wrong way. And there's a new way to do it. And there's a new power and authority in place. And it's not you. So the Sanhedrin is losing power. And they didn't like it. The Romans were losing power as well. Because the Christians were crazy. Um, and I, I put that in, I guess, in a good sense. Um, there was actually a leader that came out and said, please do not go and try to find the magistrate. And tell him that you're a Christian so you can be burned at the stake. Make him come get you. Uh, and the problem was, is the Christians were so sold out on what their faith was, that they were actually finding people that they knew would martyr them so they could be martyred. And, and it was really challenging the authority and the structure of the Roman, of the Roman nation. And, and people look at these people with this faith and going, what in the world are they doing? And they were being converted over to Christianity and paganism. And the people that were running the temples, the people that were doing um, business with the idols, and even Caesar himself, uh, who was to be worshipped as a god and was not being worshipped as a god anymore, saw the, the Christians as a real threat to their authority. And last was mysticism. Uh, we love our mystery. We love magic. Uh, I, I, there, there's a difference in, in culture between two different things, two opposing forces. And, and I'm going to use terms that are a little bit different than you may be familiar with. I'm going to use two terms. One is myth and one is magic. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with myth. And, and people may think that myth means it's not true. That's not what I'm talking about. The meaning of myth is it's something, it's a story that helps explain the world around us. What the Bible is, is a story. It's a true story, but it's a story that explains the reality that's around us. 
uh, the Christian faith is something that is true and it explains the reality that's around us. So myth explains reality, it helps us understand it, helps us put it into order so that we know what's going on, how we can put ourselves within it. It explains the Christian faith explains who we are, explains who God is, and explains how we work in that relationship between us and God. What, what magic on the other hand does, what magic does is it controls the world that's around us. Myth explains, magic controls. And, and the problem with magic is it puts us in the place of God. And that's what a lot of the paganism did, is it, is it helped us, we were able to go ahead and give offerings to the gods to appease them so they would do what we want. It was a form of magic. Uh, in a very real sense, if you didn't follow the relationship that God set up in the Old Testament in the laws with the sacrifices, you could very well end up giving sacrifices at the temple to somehow try to control who God is and, and therefore exert control over the environment around us. Anything that gets control of the environment around us through our religion is magical. Um, in a very real sense, uh, I think that's one of the big problems with the prosperity gospel. Um, and I think there's things in prosperity gospel that are from the Bible and are true. I'm not saying that the entire, the entire thing needs to be thrown out. What I am saying is this, if prosperity gospel tells you, if you give 10%, God's going to give you your 10% back and more, you got another thing coming. If the prosperity gospel tells you, if you do this, God's going to have to do that. If it obligates God, it is magic. If it's, if it's something you do because you love God and you want to, that's mysticism. That's myth. That explains the reality around you. It doesn't control you. So what the, the Christian faith was doing is it was challenging Rome's ability to control reality because the Christians just didn't really care about the Roman gods. They really didn't care if they died or not. They were coming and they were doing these crazy things. They were presenting the gospel and people were seeing the power of it. They were seeing healings happen. They were hearing tongues being given. They were seeing the miraculous move of God. And they were taking the attention away from the Roman mysticism and replacing it with the Christian mysticism. They were taking away the Roman magic and replacing that with no magic whatsoever. And it was really destroying the fabric of Rome. The last thing that really was a watershed it was called Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba was a revolt that happened in Jerusalem. And it, it basically got Jerusalem free of the Romans for three years. So there was a, there was a rabbi who, who identified this one guy and he called him Bar Kokhba. And he said, this is the Messiah. This is the new guy. He was a general. And he got all these people together with him and he helped overthrow the Romans. He got them out for three years. But at the end of that war, what ended up happening is Rome came back in, re-exerted its, its control, and 580,000 Jewish people, by estimate, died in the process of that war. Half a million Jewish people died. Um, Adrian, uh, who was the emperor at the time, banished Jews from Jerusalem. So he said no Jews are allowed in Jerusalem at all. Got them all out of the town. And the biggest thing was the Christians rejected Bar Kokhba as Messiah, and they refused to fight. Because the Jews or the, the Christians refused to fight, the Jews saw the, uh, the Christians as traitors to the Jewish faith in mass. They were, they were not Jewish anymore by nationality. They were not Jewish anymore by religion. They were completely outside the fold of Judaism. And there was, another, there was another part to that that was a negative part in the Christian church. Because the Christian church at that point began to realize that if they were identified with the Jews and they were identified as Christians, they were getting it from both sides. So the, the Christian church began to look at things and say, you know what, we don't need to look as Jewish as we used to look. And what happened is the Christian church lost a lot of the underpinnings that, that built the faith that were part of the, the, the Jewish tradition because they didn't want to be associated with the Jews. That was a bad thing. Uh, as Christians, we have lost a lot. And we're, we're, it seems like to a certain extent, we're starting to reestablish re it and reclaim it. Uh, but we lost a lot of the foundations of why we do what we do. Uh, it, it has just been in the last few years that we've really begun to put uh, the importance of what um, Passover is with communion back into communion. Uh, and we're just now starting to see people talk more about what baptism is and what it means and what its Jewish roots are. Uh, we've, we've lost a lot of the importance of what the Jewish feasts were and, and how they prefigured Christ and how they prefigured the end times as well. Uh, we have lost a lot of the underpinnings of what our faith really is based on when we, we rejected the Jewish uh, origins of the Christian faith. 
The other side of that, though, uh, is the Jewish people really persecuted the Christians all the more and said, we can have nothing with us whatsoever. Uh, we are done with the Christians. So that was a major watershed. Um, what happened after that is the centers of the church moved out, for the most part, out of Jerusalem. There still were some folks there, but it was primarily Jerusalem and Antioch, which was in Greece. And then it was Carthage or Hippo in Rome, which is also, and also Alexandria was mixed in there as well. And what began to happen, what that was, that was the beginning seed. And we're going to pick this up next week because I'm almost done. What that did is that planted the seed for the two separate churches that we have today. That's the, what we call the Catholic Church. On one side of the Catholic Church is the Western Church, and that's the Roman Catholic Church. The other part of the, the Catholic Church, and I don't think that the, the Orthodox would want to call themselves Catholic, but they're, they're closely related, um, is the Eastern Orthodox Church. So we'll refer to it as the Eastern Orthodox Church, which is primarily in Greece and Turkey and um, up in, in um, uh, up in Russia, all that part of the of the Mediterranean, that went one way with the church, and then Rome and Alexandria and and uh, Spain and uh, Germany and France, all those areas went with the Roman Catholic Church. And and basically from the era of about 300 A.D. Uh, up until about 1500, that was the rule of the land. Uh, next week, what we're going to be talking about, and if if you're listening in, and you want to do a little bit of homework. We're going to really be getting into uh, the beginnings of the Catholic Church, the beginning of the, the popes. Uh, we're also going to talk a lot about a guy uh, who's really important. He's called um, Constant, Constantine uh, the Great. He was a Roman emperor, uh, and he's the one who uh, saw a vision of this guy that said, in this sign conquer. So if you're getting ready for next week, next week we're going to talk a lot about Constantine and the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, that's it for tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, I think Scott can put up uh, the, um, the link for the the, uh, what do you call it? the email. It's been a long day. There you go. Uh, info at pioneernetwork.org. If you have any questions, any thoughts, uh, any ideas, email them to, to that email. We'll take a look at them. If there's any that come in, I'll go ahead and read them online next week, and uh, we'll see you then. Have a good night.